If you'll find you a red book there, red hymn book, and it should be one under the seat, under you, in front of you, but around you somewhere there. Pass around, make sure everybody has a hymn book. Let's turn to page 176. Make sure everybody has one around you. Don't, don't let anybody be kind of guessing through this. A beautiful song says, an old account was settled long ago. Page 176. Join in. There was a time on earth when in the book of heaven an old account was standing for sins yet unforgiven. My name was at the top and many things below. I went unto the keeper and said, Long ago, long ago, long ago, yes, the old account was settled. When the old account was settled long ago, the old account was large and growing every day. For I was always sinning and never tried to pay. But when I looked ahead and saw such pain and woe, I said that I would settle and settle long ago, long ago. God this morning that I can not just sing that, but I can say it, and I believe it today. Next song kind of sums it up. It says, I've never been sorry ever since I accepted Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I'll assure you, I've never had one day of regret of that. A lot of things I've regretted in life, but I've never regretted having accepted Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Everyone join in on this one. I've never been sorry. Jesus saved and pardoned. I have been singing every day. I've never been sorry. Praise the Lord. I trust his Blessed name. holy name. Through the dark shadows, he is with me, leading me on the upward way. I've never been sorry. Praise the Lord. I trust his name.
you stand and join in with the praise team up here in front. We're going to sing a couple songs. The first one's called I Speak Jesus. It talks about the power in the name of Jesus. And because of that power, I can change everything with the power of the name of Jesus. So we want to speak it everywhere we go. Over, speak it over our family. Speak it to everyone that we meet. And so just sing along with us um, this morning.
called Trust in God. No matter what we're going through, we can put our trust in God. He's going to take care of us. I was uh, reading um, where David, well, I've been reading about David being chased by Saul. If you're in the chronological study, you're reading that. Or you, I'm behind, so you might have read that last week. But um, anyway, today I actually read um, in one of the Psalms, Psalm 34 or 35, where um, David has a few lines of this, this song. They've got it from that Psalm, I'm sure, where it says, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. So this song is that we can trust in God. If David can trust in God, you know, being chased down uh, by, Saul, by Saul, you know, there was a calling on David's life, but he trusted in God through all that. Um, when you seek the Lord, he'll hear and he'll answer. So just sing along with us.
know, thinking through the different music that we sing here and the other things that we do throughout the service, uh, as you start through the week, praying and planning for things, sometimes you never know which way God's going with things. And uh, after looking back many a time, you say, boy, I know where God was going now. I know exactly what he's doing. This song here, I think, sums up a lot of things we've sung here this morning and even the uh, uh, hearts uh, that are being felt here this morning uh, by the Holy Spirit. I just think uh, God is so great here today. And I want you to be praying that God will have his will and his way and everything that happens here today. Might be somebody your day is lost, never come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I'd pray that you wouldn't leave this building until you make certain that you know that your home is in heaven. And as I sing this song, just uh, if you know what you want to join in, it'll be fine. But the uh, beautiful song has a great message in it. chapter 22. I do want to jump right in this morning. We have a lot to cover this morning. Genesis chapter 22. So they'll be working upstairs with the younger ones, four through fifth grade, and then also they'll be helping in the nursery of those younger than four. Um, but again, if you want to turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 22, verses 16 through 18, and I've titled this morning's message, 
the global mission of God, the global mission of God. Last week we asked the question, what is God's goal for your life? What is God's goal for your life? That was the title of the message. That was a question we posed last week. We also asked the question, what is your goal for your life? And then the final question, are they the same? What is God's goal for your life? What is your goal for your life? And are they the same? What if they're not? Do you remember what we talked about that last week? We talked about there's two different roads, especially for us here in America. There is the pursuit of happiness. I mean, it's, it's in the Declaration of Independence about this country. I mean, it's a foundational document about the pursuit of happiness. We think about the American dream. And the American dream, you think about what does that involve? It involves comfort and ease, security, happiness. I mean, that, that's what we all desire. That's what we all want. And that's maybe what we all should want. That's what we think of. Everything is driving that direction. But then last week I brought up a different path. And it's not a pursuit of happiness, but what was it? It was a pursuit of holiness. And the pursuit of happiness and the pursuit of holiness are not the same. The pursuit of holiness in Jesus Christ the holiness of Christ. Now here's the thing about this road. It's not comfortable. The other road is comfortable. And that's the whole point of that road is comfort and ease, happiness. But if we choose to follow Christ and being a Christian, being a disciple, being a follower of Christ is the pursuit of holiness, the holiness of Christ, and it's not comfortable. It's being conformed to his image. It's being changed. It's being transformed. It involves change and transformation, and it even involves suffering. Jesus said that a servant is not above his master. If they've called the, house, the, the, the master of the house, Beelzebub, what are they going to say about his servants? If, he, if he's not above suffering, how can we be above suffering? This is the pursuit of holiness. It is challenging. It is not comfortable. It involves suffering, but it is also glorious. This road is not glorious. The pursuit of happiness is not glorious. You just wait and see. It begins to fade. It's temporal, and it, it involves this life. The pursuit of holiness gets broader and broader and broader. It is difficult, but it is glorious. So, my question to you is, which one did you choose? Were you here last week? Which one did you choose? Do you choose the pursuit of happiness? Or do you choose the road that Christ has laid out for every one of us to follow Him in the pursuit of holiness, the holiness of God, the holiness of Christ? Which will you choose? Which will I choose? What is God's goal for your life? This morning, we're going to look at what is God's goal, period. What is the goal of God? Because I want, to, I want to cast this out there for you and say, this is the goal of God. Therefore, I must align my goal, my goals with his goal. He's the standard. What is the goal of God? What is the global mission of God? What is God's goal? And I want to begin at the beginning this morning at the book of Genesis, at the Genesis. The book of Genesis chapter 22. The context of this chapter is Abraham. God has promised Abraham and his wife Sarah a child. They, 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 he promised that when Abraham was 75 years old. Sarah was 65 years old. They couldn't have children. But God says, you're going to have a child. It was, it was a stretch at 75 and 65. God waits 25 more years. At the age of 100 for Abraham and 90 for Sarah, a miracle happens. 
And Isaac, the son of Abraham and Sarah, was a miracle child born to a 90-year-old woman. That's the context of what we're going to be reading this morning, is that, is that God has now fulfilled this promise. He's given Abraham and Sarah a, a child in their old age, at the age of 100, the age of 90, and now God says to Abraham in, in Genesis 22, and we're going to come back to this probably next week. He says, I need you to get, take your son, Isaac, and kill him and offer him as a burnt sacrifice. We're going to come back to that probably next Sunday morning. But in the context of that, please stand in honor of God's Word. His Word, not my Word, His Word. Genesis 22, verse 16 through 18. And as Abraham is obedient to God, he does what God said. God stops him, and he says, it's just, we're picking up right at the end of this, as Abraham has now been obedient to God and offering his son, in verse 16 it says, And God said unto him, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed, as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of its enemies. Listen to verse 18. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Lord, in prayer together. God, this is so foundational. We are, we are the fulfillment of verse 18. We're not Jewish. We're not Israelites. We're not the nation that you formed miraculously through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But we are of the fulfillment of verse 18. That through his seed, which was not just Isaac, of which Isaac was just a shadow, but through the seed of Abraham, who is Jesus Christ, a descendant of Abraham, the Messiah, through the seed of Abraham, we have been blessed. Father, we are in this passage, we're in this text. This event that happened almost 4,000 years ago has led us to this morning. It doesn't get any weightier than this. But I pray that you would speak to each one of us powerfully this morning. Challenge us. This is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. God, help us to see that this morning. As we said to begin this service, to be completely surrendered to you in everything. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You can be seated. So God is going to raise up a nation. You know, it doesn't get it much earlier than this. In God's plan of redemption. This is the very beginning of that plan. It's going to begin with this man, Abraham. And do you know how salvation comes to Abraham? Through faith. If you're saved here this morning, do you know how you, know, do you, know how you became saved? Do you know how you experienced the salvation of God? Through faith. Abraham trusted God and is accounted unto him as righteousness. The same thing happened to me. Hopefully the same thing has happened to you. I know it's happened to many people in this room. It does not get, Abraham is referred to later in the New Testament as the father of the faithful. Because the faith, the faith, the Christian faith begins with Abraham here in Genesis chapter 22. With Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God is now going to raise up a nation through Abraham. Through which all nations of the earth, through whom I should say, or through which all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Do you see God's goal? And in thy seed, I've underlined it for you, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Do you see God's goal? His global goal is in sight. We see the whole world in God's plan. And I want to draw your attention to the last statement that's not underlined. Because thou hast obeyed my voice. We see that the whole world is inside here, is in view here. God's global goal 
And it is driven by obedience to His voice. I want to start there at the beginning. But let's continue. Let's fast forward a thousand years. Psalm 67. Psalm 67. Fast forwarding almost a thousand years into the future. Possibly more than that. Listen to what this psalm, this song inspired by the Holy Spirit. The, the Bible is God's Word. It is inspired. It, it is the Holy Spirit is the author of this book. God is the author of this book. And in Psalm 67, listen to what God says. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause His face to shine upon us. So that is the prayer for Israel. That the Lord will be merciful to us. That He'll bless us. He'll cause His face to shine upon us. You hear that said sometimes at the end of services, in Christian services. And, and, but it goes on in verse 22. So that thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among, what does it say? All nations. The blessing of Israel wasn't just about a nation, it was about the nations. That, that thy way bless this nation, bless us, that us is Israel. God, be merciful unto us, be merciful unto Israel, bless us and cause your face to shine upon us. Say law, pause. That thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Verse 4. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth, say law. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Do you see the goal of God? The global goal of God. The nations, the nations, the nations, all the people, all the ends of the earth. I now come to Matthew chapter 28. Fast forward another thousand years. We read it this morning in our Sunday school class, I believe providentially. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Because what I want you to see here is that what Jesus says is not new. Matthew chapter 28, it says, this is after Jesus Christ, the fulfillment has come, the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the son of David, all these things, he's the complete fulfillment of the, all messianic promises is in Jesus Christ, and in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Christ is now died upon the cross for our sin, to take away our sin, so now all nations can be blessed through him, <clears throat> the seed of Abraham. He's resurrected to prove he truly is the Messiah, the Son of God, the, the full payment for sin. That God provided payment for sin and for evil. He's now resurrected and he's getting ready to ascend back to the Father. And that's when he gives this commission. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. I want to show you something in this passage. I want you to see in this passage that we are not called to teach. I am not called to teach, you are not called to teach. And we are not called to make disciples. That is not our calling. We are not called to make disciples of Christ. We are not to teach. We are to teach all nations. That's the, that's the command. The command is to teach all nations. Do you see? There's no, not a to teach and then this extends all nations. But, but go ye therefore and teach. Make disciples. As, I, as Christ is saying, as I am the master, I have discipled you. You go make disciples of me in all nations. We are not called to make disciples. We are called to make disciples of all nations. We are called to teach all nations. That's the great commission of Jesus Christ, given with all power. Teach and make disciples of all nations. 
Now we've looked into the past, we've looked into the distant past, all the way back to the book of Genesis, we've looked at Psalm 67, we could go on and on and on this morning, but now we've looked at Christ, we've gone 2,000 years back to Christ and the Great Commission, which is still ongoing today, now let's look into the future. Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5 and verses 9 through 10. And they sang a new song saying, singing this about the Lamb, the light of the tribe of Judah that John turns and sees, but he turns and looks. It's a Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. And they sing this new song about that Lamb. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou was slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. I want you to see in this passage Jesus was not slain and he did not shed his blood to redeem us. If you say Jesus was slain and he shed his blood to redeem us, that's not true. It's incomplete. Jesus was slain, the most significant event in all of human history, more significant than every other event in human history, all combined. Jesus was slain and he shed his blood to redeem us from every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Not just to redeem us, but to redeem us out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. I would also say to you this morning that Jesus Christ is not the Lamb of God to take away sin. If you say Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God to take away sin, that's not true. It's incomplete. That isn't why he was slain. That isn't why he shed his blood. John chapter 1, verse 29 John the Baptist proclaimed, the next day it says, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away, what? The sin of the world. Not just sin. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. All inclusive. Jesus Christ has come to take away the sin of the whole world. Last of all, Revelation 7. We go back to the end again, verses 9 through 12. Jesus Christ has come to take away the sin of the world, and he will do it. His mission will be accomplished. And we see that in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. That, that, was, that is the mission. That's the global mission of God. Jesus Christ fulfilling this global mission and it will be fulfilled. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. And after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and, and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. I want you to see it. Jesus Christ will accomplish his mission. The multitude is being gathered, which no man can number, and they're being gathered from every nation, kindred, people, and tongue. As I read these passages of Scripture, I want to be part of this. I have to be part of this. We have to be part of this. It is the global mission of God. It is the global mission of God of which all of us are called. The Great Commission is to every one of us. So, what's the status? Well, 
thank God we have the capability today that we can do, we can crunch the numbers. What's the status? Where does the mission of God, where does it stand today? If you go to the next slide, Julie. I've got some numbers up here. Where does it stand today? First off, I've got some good news. The global mission of God has reached half the world. Now that's good news because it started with 120 people 2,000 years ago. It has now reached half the world has been reached. The good news is half the world has been reached with the gospel. Praise God. But the bad news is half the world has been reached with the gospel. Half the world. These numbers I have up here on the screen, there's 8 billion people in the world. 3.4 billion of them are unreached with the gospel. That's a lot of people who have been reached with the gospel. But there's a lot of people who haven't. 3,400 million people have been unreached with the gospel. 3.4 billion are unreached with the gospel out of 8 billion. Now, we can talk about people. We can talk about, you know, 180 nations, whatever, within the world. And thank God we have the technology and the ability to be able to, to, to quantify these things. There are 17,213 people groups in the world. That's, that can be, in Papua New Guinea, there might be 800. In one country, there's like 800 people groups, as the Roar Balls have told us, to where it, it's not just saying, well, it, it's just a nation, but it's people groups within that nation. Tribe, tongue, people, language, different language groups. Of that 17,213, 7,280 are still unreached. A little more than halfway. That last statistic, 173,451, do you know what that number is? They covered it during the IMB, during the mission conference we did um, a few weeks ago. President of the IMB, Paul Chitwood, rattled that number off. What does it represent? 173,451 people die every day who do not know Jesus Christ. That's almost two kneeling stadiums every day of people who die lost. Now, within that number, there's a lot of people who have heard the gospel and they've rejected it. Have you shared the gospel with people? Has it been rejected? I don't know how many times I've been rejected in sharing the gospel. Thousands, literally thousands. Within that number, there are people who have heard the gospel and they've rejected it. But I want you to understand, a big part of that number are people who have never heard the gospel. Now, that's a problem. It's heartbreaking when somebody dies lost, having rejected the gospel. I know people personally who have rejected the gospel. They've rejected Christ and they've died without Him. But it's different when you've never even heard the gospel. Nobody's told them. That's different. Yeah, they have light. Yes, they have creation. Yes, they have their conscience, which we talked about. They're, they bear the image of God, but nobody's told them that Christ is Lord. All power is His. Those who go unwarned, unreached, The good news is half the world has been reached. The bad news is half the world has been reached. I could go on and on with scriptures. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved half of the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what my Bible says. For God so loved the world. Eight billion. What are we going to do about this? 
what are we going to do about this? 173,000, in my entire life, I've not shared the gospel with 173,000 people. How do you reach 3.4 billion people? How do you go to 7,280 different people groups with different languages? I see those numbers, and they're heartbreaking. I want you to think about it. Raise your hand if you were raised in church. If you were taken to church, look around this room. This may not be everybody in this room, but look around this room. What if there was no church to be raised in? There are people in our county, some kids are being raised in church, some are not. I mean, sadly, that number is going down. We have a tremendous amount of work to do in Friendsville and in Blount County, but what if there's no church to be raised in? You couldn't go if you wanted to. There's nowhere to go. There is no church. Where would I be? My mom took me to church. My stepdad took me to church. My dad took me to church. What if there wasn't a church? I can't fix this. But I committed years ago to say I can do something. I cannot, I can't, I can't fix this, but I feel responsible for it. I am responsible for it. I can't do all of this. I, look, I can't reach that many people, but I can do something. You can't fix this, but you can do something. I'll go to Blount County Jail. I'll go after that number, 173,451. I'll tell somebody about Christ today. I'll go to Blount County Jail. I'll talk to my coworkers. I used to talk to my classmates. I'll come to Marble Hill. I'll go to India. I'll go to Mali. I'll go to Mongolia. I'll go to Papua New Guinea. I'll go to Haiti. I can sit and just got back from Panama. We cannot fix this, but we can do something. But you know, as I, as I look at that and I think, I can't touch that number, but I can do something. That's my response. That's my answer. I'm changing my answer as of this morning. I'm no longer saying I can do something. We've worked with the India. We've sent money to India. We've gone to India. We've been trying to see disciples made and churches planted and wells dug and pastors trained and kids taught about the Lord. We've been doing something. I'm not going to do something anymore. I'm going to do everything I can. There's a difference. I'm not just going to do something. I want to do everything I can. I mentioned I rattled off some countries. India, Mali, Papua New Guinea, Honduras, Nicaragua, Haiti, Mongolia. Y'all remember when we went to Mongolia? Y'all remember that? Were you here? It's 12 years ago. Jane and I went to Mongolia. That trip was a little different. I think we've been to India nine or ten times. Mongolia was different. Do you know why it was different? Jan and I was associate pastor at that time. It was 12 years ago. I've been associate pastor for four years. Jan and I went to Mongolia with Tommy Tillman, Harbor Evangelism, to see, God, are you calling us to Mongolia? A communist in the Gobi Desert. That was an exploratory trip. God, are you calling us to the mission field? I believe we got our answer. No. I'm calling you to pastor Marble Hill Baptist Church. Uh, we came back. Uh, we saw things there. We came back, and there just wasn't a peace. Going there, we thought, we're going to Mongolia. We came back and said, it's not Mongolia. I got a call from Keith Ross, who was the pastor, and said, I'm stepping down as pastor. And God said, you're going to be the pastor of Marble Hill Baptist Church. And that's what I've done for the last 12 years. It would have been disobedient for me to have gone to Mongolia because God made it clear, you're right here. I've called you to be the pastor of this church. He made it abundantly clear. Every year since then, I pray. I don't pray this because I'm a pastor. I don't pray this because I'm a preacher. I pray this because I'm a Christian. Every year I pray, God, have you called me to the mission field? Is it this year? 
God, I'm checking. You said you want me to pastor Marble Hill Baptist Church. I'm going to pastor with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm going to love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I want to give it everything I've got because the local church is so important. It is so This is more important than Grace Hours Ministry. This is more important than, than jail ministry. The local church is so incredibly important. And every year I pray and say, God, are you calling me to the foreign mission? Are you calling me to another nation? Or are you calling me to Marble Hill Baptist Church? For 12 years, God has said... Marble Hill, you're going to be the pastor of that church. A few months ago, I got a different answer. While we were in Papua New Guinea, God said, now. And I just kind of laugh. You've heard my sermons the past few weeks. I had a plan. Mongolia made sense here. Plan A. Plan B is I retire from Oak Ridge National Lab and I become a self-funded missionary. God said, no, it's not plan A. And I said, okay, then I will do plan B. I will be the pastor of this church. I'll give it everything I've got. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to work two jobs. I'm going to continue to work in my career and I'm going to have a retirement. I'm going to retire and I'm going to go to the mission field as a, a self-funded missionary. And God said, I'm presenting you option C. You're not waiting 12 more years. You're going now. And I said, Lord, that is the worst possible timing in my career. And I struggled with that the whole time we were in Papua New Guinea. And since we've been back, and I've said, Lord, this doesn't make any sense. The worst possible time. But you see, it's his plan. All these scriptures come to mind. I'll preach it right now. God, are you going to give me a son in my young age? Or are you going to give me a son in my old age? I'm going to give you a son in your old age, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. Because Isaac is one of the most critical figures in the entire Bible, but he's not God. And you don't put your son, even a miraculous son of promise, and who's going to be, through whose line the Messiah is going to come, he's not God. And God said, I want this one. And Janet and I have prayed about this, and it hit us both simultaneously. I said, what are we waiting on? She said, I don't know. I thought the exact same thing. We have to go. Worst possible timing. I had my plan. God said, hand me your plan. It's his plan. I brought in an expert witness here. My retirement from Oak Ridge National Lab is pretty good, isn't it? I've done the math. I've done the math. It's his. I'm out. Jan and I have applied with the International Mission Board. <laughs> Don't misunderstand my emotion. We're going to sell everything we've got. I'm going to walk away. At work, we call them the golden handcuffs. 20 years in, they put the golden handcuffs on. You ain't going nowhere. God said, take them off and hand them back to them. I got some more for you to go. I don't care about that. The problem is I can't be there and be here. I can't be with my family and my church and be there. That's why I'm sad. Because I want to pastor Marble Hill and I want to go. But I can't do both. And God has said, go. Go. So we've applied. It's a long process. It could fall through. And I want you to be praying, because at any point in this process, God may say, no, Jordan. I've got the knife. I'm ready, to, I'm ready to stab my pension. I'm ready to kill my 401k. I'm ready to kill all of it. Stop. Keep Pastor Marble Hill. He may do that. Or he may say, it's gone. 
Praise God, it's gone. Because God's better than a pension. Christ is better than a pension. He's better than a 401k. He's better than comfort. He's better than ease. He's better than everything. And I've been preaching it for 12 years. Now I'll live it. And if I die today, I sent the application in. I did the consultations. I'm started doing the paperwork. I was obedient. We go to the next slide. Talk about unreached people groups. That's what she looks like. You see, no, red is bad. Red means unreached. I don't know where we're going. We won't know. I'm going to get you to pretty ways in the process before you even see the list. Would you like to guess where I'm going? You look at that map and see if you can guess. I think we do know where we're going. I think I've known for 12 years. That's all I know. I've thought a lot about this. We've been thinking about this for weeks. I'm so thrilled. I got to talk to the leaders Wednesday night to let them know. I know, I know it's hard to hear this. I don't like change. If God calls me to be the pastor of the church for 50 years, praise God. I would love to be the pastor of the church for 50 years, but you know, there was a time in my life, I didn't, that's the last thing I wanted. Bill Ross is sitting here. One of the greatest things he ever did for me was when he stepped up about 25 years ago and he said, I've got a full-time job. I've, I'm working 70 hours a week and all that's going on, but yes, I will pastor Marble Hill Baptist Church. I just won't sleep. And he didn't. But he was a mentor to me. And we weren't in this building. I sat right over here about where James is sitting, and I sat and I listened. I was perverted and prideful and egotistical and foul-mouthed and you name it. But I sat there and I listened, and I watched, and I listened, and I watched. And I said, I need to be, I need to be like that. I need to stop living a double life. Bill doesn't live a double life. I need to stop living my double life, and I need to follow Christ. And I heard it, and there were ups and downs, and there were failures. The great, one of the greatest things Bill ever did for me was saying, yes, I'll be the pastor of Marble Hill Baptist Church. You know what? One of the other greatest things that Bill ever did for me was this, when he said, I'll resign as pastor of Marble Hill Baptist Church. Jordan, Keith, what are you going to do? I don't want to be a pastor. I didn't want to be a preacher. But God said, you're going to be a pastor. And I look back now and say, that's exactly right. Praise God. I, I had to deny myself and follow him. I cannot tell you how much. I told, I told the guys Wednesday night, if Bill had not resigned as pastor, I would be half the Christian I am today. Because he resigned. And I think he was obedient to God and accepting that call, and he was obedient to God and the leading of God when he stepped down from that call. When he stepped down, and I stepped in as associate pastor and Keith as pastor, and four years later I stepped in as pastor and have been the pastor the last 12 years. I have grown up. My, my Christian walk and my strength with the Lord and my closest Lord has doubled since then. I would highly recommend it. Maybe somebody's here this morning. Maybe God is speaking to somebody in this congregation. It might be the person you least expect. And the Holy Spirit says... Hey, I've told him he's got to go. That means you have to step up. I don't know. I like to be in control, but I'm not in control. Marble Hill doesn't belong to me. It's his church. And I'm going to do whatever he calls me to do. So I want to encourage you to pray for me and Jana. Again, he may be testing us. This may all fall through. Like I said, it's a long process. It may take, it may, it'll probably take about a year to go through the process. So this isn't something sudden, but you see, you're my family. I talked to my mom, my stepdad, my brother. I talked to them um, Tuesday. Um, Jana talked to her parents last Friday. We're letting our family know. I'm still letting my family know. Let my family know. If I go out from here, I, I want you to know I'm committed to this church, and this church will be the one who sends us. And this church is going to have a global impact. And you guys, as you send us and as you pray for us, you are fulfilling the Great Commission. You're a part of that. We talked about this in our Sunday school class. I'm not just going to repeat it all again. I know our time is limited here. 
We have to go and make disciples of all nations. You've got to stay, and you've got to teach people to observe all things whatsoever he has commanded, and lo, he's with you always. He's with us both always, even to the end of the age. He, you know, can I tell you something? He'll, I can't teach. I can't preach. I can't do anything. And God said, I know. Panic attacks at this church. Passing out. I mean, my, you know, I, I can't preach. I can't teach. God proved it. And then he gave me the gift of preaching and pastoring and teaching. He can give you the gift too. It, you can't do it, I know. Nobody can. It's a gift of God. And he can give you that gift. As we close this morning, there's a ton of details to work out. I'll ask you to stand if you would. There's a ton of details to work out, details of what we're already thinking about. I want you to know, Jan and I are going to do everything we can to leave it all on the field at this church and to leave this church in the best possible position we can for the future. And we turn it over. And we get out of, not only do we go, but we get out of the way. I think that's what Bill did 16 years ago. I think that's what Bill and June did. They said, we don't understand this. We don't know what God's doing. But I've got to step out of the way. And God said, I was sitting back here thinking anything but that pulpit. And he said, I know what I'm doing. Get up there, Jordan. I said, I'd rather die. Well, that's it. is it funny you should mention that? Because you're going to have to die to yourself. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Follow me to the pulpit. Follow me to the mission field. Follow me to the jail. Wherever he leads, we'll go. We're going to sing this song. I surrender all. <laughs> I surrender all. As I told you a minute ago, God's laid it on our heart. He's told us what He wants us to do. We've been obedient. We followed the application. I surrender all. I need you. This church needs you. Friendsville needs you. Blunt County needs you. America needs you to surrender all. Do you surrender all? I love the story of, I heard it my whole life, about the rich young ruler, go and sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. Now, Jesus didn't mean, it's exaggerated, he didn't mean for everybody to sell everything they own. Sometimes he does. Sometimes he does. Sometimes he does mean sell everything you own. Give to the poor and come follow me. He can do whatever he wants. He's God, not, not me. He's Lord, not me. I surrender all. I need you to surrender all. This church needs you to surrender all. Not some, not a lot, all. As we sing this, if you need to come and pray, I'll pray with you.